as I'm speaking in this room, according to some of the statistics that you can easily find on the internet, one in every three Americans are developing some form of kidney disease. If you do the math, that adds up to 26 million people, which is a very huge number. The good news is most of these diseases, if treated on time, can be prevented to become something very significant. There are some, however, that do develop to become very significant and fatal. For example, they become end-stage renal disease. Whenever you hear the words end-stage from a doctor's mouth, you know that things are really bad. That basically means that the organ has failed out. End-stage renal disease means that there is no kidney anymore. So we do what we call the dialysis. This is hopefully public knowledge. We've been doing that since 1940s. Dialysis is supposed to replace kidney, which is not there anymore, to flush the fluids, the toxins, and the material that the body is trying to get rid of out. End-stage renal disease put 500,000 Americans on dialysis beds last year. What we can do for them is to, we can guess, give them new kidneys. But obviously, we don't have 500,000 kidneys. We don't even have half that amount. At this point, it would be nice to know that Artificial organs won't be available until the next few decades, unfortunately, which is bad news here. As a matter of fact, less than 17,000 kidney transplants were performed last year. So if you do the math again, huge difference between supply and demand. As a result of this shortage, 13 people die every day in America waiting for a kidney. In fact, 87,000 deaths last year was attributed to some form of kidney disease. That's a bigger number than the prostate cancer deaths or the breast cancer deaths. It just doesn't make it to the news as much. Just go to Google and search for the word dialysis. These are the pictures that you will see in the first page. People from all ages, genders, races, they're struggling with this. I'm pretty sure there are a handful of you in this room who can intimately relate to this. Maybe you know someone who knows someone. Maybe it's unfortunately your uh, grandparents or a neighbor or someone. If you can't think of an example, the next speaker after me, John, has a dad who just went on dialysis three weeks ago. There you go, right here. Okay, to be able to do the dialysis, you need a very high flow rate of blood because you want to be done with it quickly in a couple of hours, a couple of sessions a week. That flow rate does not exist. You have to create it with a surgery permanently. In this surgery, in the upper left, I'm showing you that, you connect an artery to a vein. So you basically steal the blood, create a short circuit in the human vasculature in this area, and then you st put this blood basically into the vein that is close to the surface. You increase the blood flow rate 10, 15 times what it was before. Then you can access it with a needle because it's close to the surface, superficial. Then you connect it to the machine, the dialysis machine, do the job, and then circulate the blood back in. Okay, so at this stage you might think we have a disease and we have a solution, so what's the big deal? The big deal is a lot of people die on dialysis, still, on an, accept on an acceptable rate. Not because of the kidney failure or any other pathological condition, but because of dialysis itself, which is ironic. This is the treatment that is supposed to help them. In this figure, I'm showing you the vein in the upper figure that we use for dialysis. It looks like my vein, your vein, in your shoulder. It's called the cephalic vein, anatomical name for it. Don't get too carried away by the medical terms that I'm using here. Anyhow, it's, it's a normal vein. It's a tube. A couple of months through the dialysis, same patient, same vein. Looks like... Weird. It's, uh, it has developed a very narrow shape. This is very dangerous. I'm showing you the cross-sectional view of what I just told you about. If you just cut the vein and look at it under a microscope, this is what you see. This is called a histological study. On the left, again, normal vein, normal vessel wall thickness, normal inner diameter. On the right, a, a thickened vessel wall and a reduced inner diameter. This is called neoentomal hyperplasia. It's very deadly and it has claimed a lot of lives. You see a new red tissue that has formed there that wasn't there before. It's the body's own cell that has grown there. As a result of this thickening of the wall, inward thickening, the inner diameter has been reduced. On the surface, it looks something like this. It's bad, it's agonizing. We have to perform other surgeries on the patient. Angioplasty, stenting is costly. All the bad things, so we have to develop an understanding about this. We take pictures of these vessels and reconstruct the geometries with image processing in our computers, a very well-known engineering technique. And we use computational fluid dynamics shorthand CFD, which is my expertise, to simulate the blood flow in the computer. Well, now you have a tool that you can study the things in the computer, turn the knobs, change things around to know what's going on. Okay, so here's the unexpected thing. One of my mentors, 
Professor Hassan Nagib, that I have utmost respect for, once said in his turbulence class that great contributions to research fields come from the people who are sometimes not from that field because they see things from a different angle. They can think outside of the box. That's how they come up with innovative solutions. I'm willing to hope that the same thing has happened here because it really resonated with me. If you talk to doctors and ask them what's new in terms hyperplasia, they say cellular pathways, phenotypical modulations, DNA changes, all the stuff that I as an engineer admittedly acknowledge I don't know a whole lot about. I speak the language of math and physics. Mathematically, I see a shape that has changed methodically. Strategically, it looks like the body is trying to do something carefully thought out. Nature does what it does based on laws. Maybe we don't understand them, but there are laws and rules applied to it. And physics, I told you, 10, 15 times the flow rate that has been shoved in there. Of course, the fluid dynamics and the physics are changed. So the body is trying to adapt to it. So here's my, me and my colleagues have developed a hypothesis. In the upper figure, which I'm showing you a vein. The red locations are the locations where we think the blood flow is, a, is triggering some adaptive response. We think the body is trying to develop a shape that is optimally adaptive, so that it can best regulate the pressure and the stresses that are being applied to it that we are inducing on it with a huge flow rate of dialysis. I use Comsol Multiphysics and I ask the software, what is the best shape that you think best, best withstands and regulates the blood flow? that I'm inducing on it. What would be the best shape, you think? It tells me, on the lower left, the pretty picture, a narrow shape with a thicker wall, it's best strengthened to withstand this very high flow of dialysis. If you wait for the patient to fail the dialysis on the lower right, you see, oh, gee, it's right on. The same location, same behavior, same thing happened to that patient. So there we go. We have a predictive model combining CFD and, comp and shape optimization as a part of my PhD thesis, we have a predictive model. This is where the medical sciences are going. We want to know what happens in the future. It's predictive. This is a three-dimensional view of what I just told you about, and this is a prediction for another patient that we just performed. We have a ton of data to back this up. Okay, so we went out to our clinicians and co-authors in the University of Chicago nephrology section, and they say, okay, we're going to take this for a ride to see if you're right. We're going to perform human trials next year, which is huge. We're going to admit the same patients, perform the surgery that I told you about. This time around, we're going to perform these simulations, we engineers, and we're going to tell our colleagues what is the best flow rate of dialysis for these patients that can best withstand the dialysis. It's in a sweet spot, high enough to do the dialysis quickly, but not too high that's going to kill the patient. This number is different for every patient. It's depending on their basic physiologic needs and their geometries and everything. So this time around, the same vein, those bad locations with the old technique is not there anymore. So the patient can go through the dialysis for a lot longer and they can withstand it, maybe until they get a new kidney, or we just can keep them alive as much as we can, which was the whole idea of dialysis and helping these patients in the first place. So this was the idea that I thought was worth spreading and I hope I was successful in getting the message across. If you don't want to know about these things, on your way home, get a gym membership, and eat healthy, <laughs> and you can avoid all these things that I just said. Mm.